Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm so excited. We're getting so close to Christmas. Yes, that's right. Only 11 more days, and you'll be opening your present. And I just can't wait to see what I'll get. Well, have you had any conferences with Santa Claus's helpers? Oh, yes. I wrote him a long letter with three P.S.'s. Three P.S.'s? Yes. Well, now, that was some letter. What were the P.S.'s all about? I can't tell. Well, why can't you tell? Because it'll spoil a surprise. Spoil what surprise? Well, if you must know, you're one of the P.S.'s. Oh, I beg your pardon. Then don't tell me a thing. I won't. But you'll please read me the funnies anyway, won't you? Puck the comic yes. weekly? Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And I know you're anxious to see what's happening to Prince Valiant. Oh, yes, because he's on a new mission for his father, King Agua. Very well, then. Let's go past bringing up Father and Beetle Bailey, turn over the page, and here's little Iodine. Oh, could we please read little Iodine first, since she's right next to Prince Valiant? Why, certainly we can. So here we go with little Iodine. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Heden, Haddon, Hoyden, Hine. Music, please, for little Iodine. <laughs> Today, Iodine is to go to the hospital to have her tonsils taken out, and she's scared. So her mother is going to sleep at the hospital with her overnight. The third picture top row that evening, Iodine is tucked into her bed to get a good night's sleep before the operation, which is to take place in the morning. The nurse leaves the room after seeing that everything is all right, and Mrs. Trembleton says to Iodine, Now, see, mother is going to sleep right in the room with you. Early next morning, Iodine, who has not slept all night, hears her mother snoring. And last picture top row, she says, If Mom's asleep, here's my chance. And first picture bottom row, she climbs out of bed and into her clothes, saying to herself, I'm getting out of here before Mom wakes up. I don't care if I get a spanking. Later that morning, a different nurse, an intern, and the doctor come into the room. And seeing only Mrs. Trembleton in bed, wake her up. The doctor taps her on the shoulder, saying, All ready, Miss Trembleton? Just get on the stretcher. What? And suddenly, she finds herself lifted onto the stretcher. She struggles and fights back, but is quickly put on the stretcher and strapped down. And she shrieks. It's a mistake, I tell you. I'm not the patient. It's a mistake. I'm not the patient. And the doctor answers, Tut, tut, come along now. Two hours later, she's back in her room, a bandage around her throat, and minus her tonsils. And her throat is aching. Mr. Trembleton discovered what has happened, and has found iodine and is about to give her a spanking. When he overhears the nurse say, Oh, it was a terrible mistake, yes, but just be calm, and don't try to talk for at least a week. And Mr. Trembleton, who thinks his wife talks too much, hearing this, says, Huh? She'll be speechless for a week. Iodine... You've just been spared a spanking. <laughs> what a joke that was on Mrs. Trimbleton. Yes, yeah, she stayed in the hospital room to keep iodine company. <laughs> and then iodine slips out of the room, and when the doctor and the nurse come in, they think Mrs. Trimbleton is the one to have the operation, and they won't listen to her, and they just go ahead and take off her tonsils. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the craziest <laughs> mistakes I've ever heard of. <laughs> yes, me too. Well, now let's go across the page to Prince Valiant. Yes, and I'm anxious to read that because last week you said he'd gone on a new mission for his father. Yes, there was much trouble in the kingdom of Thule, and King Aguar is anxious to find a way to stop it. So he sent Val away on a trip to see if he can find a way to settle the trouble. Oh, now let's see if he does. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Grey, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Val 
Gael's father, King Agwar, disturbed by the fighting between the people of his kingdom, had tried to bring peace to his fierce Northmen by introducing Christianity. However, he was greatly disturbed to learn that in spite of the work of his missionaries, some of his fierce Northmen refused to become Christians, had killed some of the missionaries who were bringing the word of God to them, and were causing great trouble in the kingdom. Val volunteered to go through the kingdom to see how matters stood. And today we find him, last picture, top row, with his two companions at the edge of a forest. They meet a druid, who is a member of an old pagan religion. The druid is preparing a yule log for the midwinter celebration of the Feast of Thor, when the longest night will pass, and the gods of summer gather strength to contend against the powers of the frost giants. The strange powers of the druids are well known. But Val and his companions are surprised when the old man stares long from under shaggy brows. And then first picture, second row, says, Oh, you are Prince Valiant, and you follow a foreign religion. But though you are false to the gods of Thule, you are welcome to share my poor hospitality. Last picture, second row, Val and his friends are in the Druid's cave, being served food and drink by the old priest. The Druid's cave is a shrine, and the idols of Odin, Thor, and Loki, rough-hewn in wood, stand in a niche behind a stone altar. First picture, bottom row, when they have eaten their fill, the Druid turns to Val. It is the custom to present some small gift for hospitality received. All I ask of you is that you believe what your eyes behold. And he leads the prince to the entrance where the rays of the setting sun are blinding after the gloom of the cave. And then turning to Val, he fills a goblet with sacred wine, then says, Here, drink the nectar of the gods as you look into the west. Yes, you see, Odin was the chief druid god. He's the god of wisdom, the god of war, the god of the dead people. And Thor is the ancient druid god of thunder. And Loki was the blacksmith of the gods. He made the swords and the spears. Oh, that's interesting. That's very, very interesting. Those ancient people believed in many gods, didn't they? Yes, they did. That was nice of that old priest to be so kind to Val. I wonder what Val will see when he looks in the west and drinks from the goblet. Well, we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page. On page five, there's Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood, the merry outlaw who was having trouble with Prince John, who was trying to seize the throne from his brother, King Richard, who is held prisoner in a foreign land. And uh, last week, you remember, Robin Hood had rescued the, the maid Marion who'd been captured by Prince John. Yes, and Robin had a terrible time escaping from the castle. But now he's back in Sherwood Forest again, recovering from the spear wound he received when he made his escape. I wonder if he will get well. well with a maid Marion nursing him, he's sure. But we'll find out for sure right now. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's Merry Merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi ho! The wound Robin received was very bad, and for a week he's been a pretty sick man. The maid Marion and Prior Tuck have been nursing him carefully. Although Robin wants to get up out of bed, they refuse to let him. Now it is early morning at the outlaw camp in the depths of Sherwood Forest, and the Maid Marion is cooking breakfast for the outlaws, and especially for Robin. Off to one side, Alan Dale is singing a song. I'd sing of good Robin Hood, wounded and sick. I'd sing of our king, may he hurry back quick. I'd sing of Prince John, be it only to mock. If he comes here, we'll split him from noddle to knock. Marion sees Friar Tuck come out of Robin's hut. She asks how Robin is behaving this morning. The friar replies, Oh, worse than ever. Determined he's going to get up. Last picture, top row. Marion goes into the hut and finds Robin sitting up on his cot. First picture, bottom row. She pushes him back on the cot, telling him he can't get up yet. Robin answers, I've been bullied long enough by you and that, that turnip face friar. Friar Tuck, with a smile, gently pushes Robin back as Marion holds out the barley soup and tells him to drink it. Friar Tuck chuckles, Pour it down his throat. And then, from outside the cave, comes a sudden scream of a whistling arrow. Robin exclaims, The warning signal! 
Someone approaches the camp. He pushes Marion and the friar aside and buckles on his sword, goes outside. Last picture saying, Marion, stay in the shelter of the cave. Oh, Robin shouldn't get up out of bed if he's sick like that. Oh, no, he shouldn't. There must be something terribly dangerous or else I'm sure he wouldn't look so upset. Well, next week we'll find out what it is. Now let's turn over the page. And, oh, look, there's Roy Rogers. Yes, Roy Rogers, who with his friend Brimstone Barlow has slipped into the outlaw hideout at the old mission. And Roy and, and Brimstone are pretending to be outlaws, and they're hoping that they can find a way to capture all the outlaws and turn them over to the sheriff. And while they were there, they were put in one of the shacks and told to wait for the Sphinx, the leader of the outlaws. And when the door was closed, they found a girl hiding there, and she said that her father was trying to destroy the bandits, too, by using his dog. And Roy was surprised to hear this. But Brimstone was even more surprised because when he went outside the shack, he found that one of the outlaws that had been petting the dog was dead. Wonder how that happened. Well, let's read now and see if we can find out what this mystery of the dog and the dead man is. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo. As Roy busies himself tying up the outlaw who had dashed into the cabin, the door suddenly opens and Brimstone enters. Hey, Roy, the owl who'd gotten this shack dropped dead. The girl explains that her father had said he could destroy every bandit by turning the dog loose. Roy, thinking fast, says, Well, if your dad built the secret tunnels for the outlaws in this mission, maybe you know where we can hide this one. The girl quickly goes to the fireplace, pulls on a string hidden in the wall, and Roy sees the fireplace swing open from the wall, revealing an underground passage. She tells Roy the passage leads outside the mission and asks Roy to help find out where the outlaws are holding her father. Grimstone carries the outlaw into the passage. I don't like this. Even if your pop's dog is saving us the trouble of capturing the Sphinx's gang. Last picture, top row. Two outlaws, Dusty and Bigfoot, who had heard the shot, are heading for the shack where Roy is held. They see the old outlaw who had petted the dog lying on the ground. Bigfoot exclaims, Hey, look, Dusty. Something happened to the guard. They hurry to the dead outlaw, first picture, bottom row. Make a quick investigation to see what happened to him. Dusty exclaims, well, that beats me. Go tell the Sphinx the guard's dead without a mark on him. I'll see what the strangers know about this. At that moment, the dog trots over beside Bigfoot. He grabs him by the collar and throws him out of the way. <coughs> Get out of my way, you mangy crud. I beat it. Dusty walks toward the shack where he had taken Roy and Brimstone earlier. He sees the shack is empty and exclaims, Why, well, the strangers are calling themselves Brimstone and Hogleg Vamoost. And that looks like Al's hat. <laughs> A little later, in another part of the mission, Gusty rushes into a meeting of the Sphinx and his men. Hey, boss, the two strangers flew the coop. One guard's dead, and Al is missing. And then he notices that everyone is strangely silent. Hey, what's going on around here? The Sphinx pushes back his chair, beckons to Gusty, and leads him over to a table and points to Bigfoot, who had been with Gusty a few minutes before. Bigfoot is dead. Last picture, Gusty stares at him in horror and exclaims, Hey, Sphinx, don't tell me Bigfoot kicked off too. This whole mission is jinxed. Oh, it happened again. Bigfoot touched the dog to push him away, you remember? And now Bigfoot is dead. And now the outlaws are mighty worried. I don't blame them. I wonder how they can be killed just by touching the dog. I wonder too. Well, now that Roy Rogers has found that secret tunnel, maybe it'll be one way for him to find the girl's father. And then, maybe we'll find out the secret of all this. Oh, I hope so. Well, we'll find out next week. Now I'm sure you'd like to see what's happening to Flash Gordon. Oh, I would, I would. Very well, let's go to the very last page of the first section. And I'll read Flash in just a second. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. rigga rigga doon doon saskimatash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. In the jungle of the planet Venus, Queen Vicky's jet car crashed when Flash and she attempted to take off in a storm. Flash has radioed the castle for help and then turned at Vicky's cry to see two huge birds that looked like dragons with wings approaching. Searching the jungles of Venus with cold light beams from their eyes, 
the two giant flying reptiles spot Flash and Queen Vicky. The night prowlers dive headlong at them. Flash holds his fire until they are within sure range of his Temi gun. Then at the last moment, he presses the trigger. But nothing happens. The gun is empty. Flash learns too late. The remnants of his charge were used up in his encounter with the jungle beetle. And in an instant, the clutching talons have gripped their helpless prey. Last picture top row, Flash and Vicky find themselves being carried high above the towering tree. The captive humans dare not try to break loose, for a fall from such a height would be fatal. The birds head for the top of a mountain crag, and first picture bottom row, drop Flash and Vicky beside a nest in which the young are crying for food. Then the mother and father bird fly away as the young birds in the nest turn toward Flash. Bruised and chilled, Vicky clings to Flash in hysterical fear. He quickly tears himself loose and draws a miniature flame gun from a hidden holster. A sudden blast of fire sends the startled dragon brood fleeing with raucous shrieks. As the birds fly off, last picture, Flash tells Queen Vicky, All right, we're safe now. But he doesn't believe his own words. Under his breath, he mutters to himself, This mountain is unscalable. We're trapped. And those monsters are bound to return. Flying to the air above the mountains there with Flash. So was I. If they'd let Flash drop, the fall would have killed him. Gee, it was lucky Flash had that hidden gun. You bet it was. It saved his life. But now what'll happen to him way up there on the mountain where he can't get away? Well, we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. Now let's pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, yes, because I know we'll find Dagwood there. Yes, we will. Here he is on the first page. And now let's find out what crazy thing Dagwood on the first page of the second section does today. Here we go with Dagwin and Blondie. Ram a food, am a fum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwin and Blondie. Dagwood is in front of a pet shop looking at a sign in the window which reads, Talking Parrots. He exclaims, Why, it's just what I've always wanted. And a few minutes later, Dagwood is inside the pet shop pointing to a parrot. Hey, does he really talk? Why, he can recite Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. The proprietor snaps his fingers. And last picture, top row, the parrot babbles. Oh, to be or not to be, that is a question. Ship ahoy! I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Happy days! Dagwood's hat pops off in amazement. The proprietor says, I'm an old... He also speaks French and Spanish. I'm an old smoothie. First picture, second row, Dagwood jerks out his wallet. I'll take him. Here's your money. Last picture, second row, Dagwood is home. Hey, come downstairs, everybody. See what I've got for you. Blondie, Cookie, Alexander, and the dog rush into the parlor and see the parrot. Oh, a parrot. Hey, gee, that's terrific. Yeah, wait till you hear what he can do. And then Dagwood turns to the parrot and says, All right, come on now, say something. Hey, come on. Say hello. But the parrot says, Nothing. Hey, please, please, don't, don't, don't just sit there. Say something. Talk, please. But the parrot says, nothing. For an hour, Dagwood tries, but the parrot says, nothing. By this time, Blondie is asleep. Cookie and Alexander leave the room. And last picture, third row, Dagwood is on his knees before the parrot. Just one little word, please, please, just one itty-bitty word. <laughs> but the parrot says, nothing. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, Dagwood enters the pet shop again. He puts the parrot down, and he says, I'll sell him back to you for half of what I paid you. The proprietor smiles. It's a deal. And last picture, Dagwood goes out the door, heading for home again. The proprietor and the parrot laugh. <laughs> and they shake hands. And the parrot says, We did it again. <laughs> And had the parrot trained so that when anybody went home with the parrot, the parrot wouldn't talk. That was a very intelligent parrot. Oh, I don't know. If he was real smart, he'd have told the proprietor to give back only one-fourth of what he paid instead of one-half. You think so? Oh, sure. He could make a better deal than that. Well, maybe he could. Yes. Well, now let's see what kind of a deal I can make with you. Would you like to read Dick's Adventures? Oh, you know I would. Very well. Let's skip to the very last page of Puck the Comic Weekly. 
And you remember that last week, Dick was dreaming that he was in the early days of America when the British had attacked the capital of the country, Washington, D.C. And the doctor was helping Dick to escape. And just when it looked like he would succeed, they were captured by three British soldiers. What will happen to Dick now? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick That's some music for adventure to stick. In his dream, Dick finds himself with Dr. Beams, a prominent Maryland physician, first picture, second row, on board one of the British ships. Dick and the doctor, now prisoners, see the British hurriedly laying in supplies as more men of war join the vast enemy flotilla. Washington is still burning, and Dick wonders where they're going to attack next. A guard brings them some food and laughs. Ah, you'll probably be taken to London, in on by the neck. And last picture, second row, he goes on. We made an ash heap of Washington. Hey, I'll let you in on a little secret. Now that you can't tell your friends on shore, the fleet just got orders to sail up the Patapsco. The same thing's gonna happen to Baltimore. And first picture, bottom row, Dick exclaims. Oh, I wish there was some way of getting off this ship so we could give the warning that they're going to attack Baltimore. And Dr. Beans shakes his head hopelessly. <laughs> This moment, last picture, in the burned city of Washington, a young lawyer is standing before President Madison. He pleads for permission to sail to the British fleet under a flag of truce. The lawyer's name, Francis Scott Key. His mission, to obtain the release of a distinguished American physician. Oh, Francis Scott Key. He was the man who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And, and what does he want President Madison to let him do? He wants the president to let him go under a flag of truce, which means no fighting allowed. That's the white flag, you see. Mm -hmm. And to ask the British, who have captured an American physician, a physician is a doctor, you know, he wants to ask the British to let the doctor go. Oh, maybe that's the doctor that's with Dick. Well, maybe it is. And next week we'll find out for sure. But now look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and I'm worried about Rusty. So am I, because last week Tex had told Rusty that Rusty's uncle, who had been in jail, was out again. And Rusty's afraid that his uncle will come and take him away from the Milestone Farm. So Rusty said he was going to run away because his uncle is a bad man. And I'm afraid he did run away. Well, let's read now and find out if you are right. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Dex had sent Rusty back to the carnival grounds to get Space Pilot, the horse that had won the race. Rusty had gone with Stovepipe, the man who had been such a good friend to Rusty and Pete. Today, a man returns to the Jones farm leading Space Pilot. He stops in front of Tex, saying, Hey, a kid named Rusty, give me a buck to bring this nag over here and to hand this note for somebody called Tex. Well, I'm Tex. Let me have the note. The man turns the horse over to him, and Tex opens the letter. And he reads... Dear Tex, on account of what you told me about Uncle Rufus being back, I think I better go away. I used a couple of the purchase certificates we won to buy some shoes and a suitcase. Oh. I'm enclosing the rest for you to give Mrs. Jones and now. <laughs> when you get this, I'll be gone for good. Tell Pete and Mr. Miles and Patty, all right. <laughs> so long, Rusty. A few minutes later, Tex is saying to Pete, Hey, uh, Pete, I got to make a flying trip out to the fairgrounds. The vans will be here for our horses any time now. You, you can help the men loading them. Oh, sure, Tex. <laughs> Last picture, top row. Tex is at the carnival speaking to the head man. Uh, are you Denver Dooley? Yeah, that's me. Well, they told me that you're the boss of the carnival. I'm uh, looking for a tall fella they call Stovepipe. A boy in a leather jacket. Name's Rusty. Uh, are they here? Well, Doc Stovepipe runs a snake oil pitch for me. And the boy, uh, hey, you must be talking about the kid with the horse. First picture, bottom row, Dooley says, Well, uh, Doc's going on ahead to Brownsdale. We're open next week. 
Yeah, we'll open next week then, Bronsdale. But, uh, boy, boy, no, boy wasn't with him. No, I don't know anything about me, him. I see. Well, thanks, friend. I'll be on my way. <laughs> Inside one of Denver Dooley's carnival trucks, Rusty and Flip are hidden away among the equipment. Rusty is saying, Jeepers, Flip, I hate to run away like this, but with Uncle Rufus out of jail, there's nothing else to do. Because he said if I didn't help him get a lot of money from Mr. Miles, he, he, he was going to take me away and, and, and be my guardian. <coughs> oh, quiet, Flip, quiet. Last picture. In the cab of the same truck, Stovepipe says to the driver, By Jove, I must be developing a psychosis. If I didn't know it was completely impossible, I would swear I heard a dog. And the driver says, Well, both of us must be nuts then, because I heard one too. Oh, Rusty has run away for sure. Yes, he has run away for sure. But it's a lucky thing that he's in that truck that Stovepipe is riding in. Yes, maybe Stovepipe will stop the truck and, and look in, and then you'll find Rusty, and then Rusty will be with the friend. I hope that'll happen. Well, we'll find that out for sure next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.